Hi, everybody. It's Bob Ost, and this is the True Community Gathering. Um, it's our weekly get together so that people have a chance to come in to a room. Um, it's a Zoom room, and I understand that there are actually real rooms, live rooms, where people can meet these days. Um, although we're still a little bit on the uh, on the side of being cautious, um, I will continue to do the Zoom thing. Um, indefinitely. Uh, it, it offers us many advantages. First of all, we don't have to worry about wearing masks because um, we're in this room together and we're, we're socially distanced by, I don't know, like cities. We're, we're socially we like at, at least one city away or at least one street away. Um, so um, we also get to do things like we're doing today, which is have somebody from London come into the room and talk to everybody that doesn't that doesn't that's not going to happen when I'm back doing these things live it's just going to be too hard to make happen so uh, we've got people here from all over the country all over the world uh, and I love the fact that um, zoom has allowed us to be international instead of New York centric so uh, here we are talking about things for 73 weeks i think it is now uh, april 17th was the first time we did this so 73 weeks later we're having discussions about not just zoom and not just uh virtual performance and and all these other things that we've talked about podcasts and radio dramas and all that um now we're at a point where actually we're actually able to talk about uh things that are happening live, uh, coming back into live theater. Uh, today's conversation with Chris and Megan uh, is going to be a real good justification for continuing to have a Zoom world um, because it's the Zoom world actually lets us connect to people that are not in our lo local area. Uh, I want you to meet Chris and Megan uh, and they're going to tell you a little bit about themselves because they they can talk you back to you about themselves more easily and more fluently than I can, although I did study. <laughs> um, but in, in, invariably, one picks out the, the, the details of somebody's background that they're not interested in and leave, leaves out the ones that they are interested in. So what do you, Megan, say hi and tell us what it is you want us to, to know about you and your background. Uh, sure. So hi, I'm Megan Shadler. Um, I guess for this conversation, it's important to say that I uh, started in New York several years ago, um, and then right before the pandemic, uh, was planning to move to the UK, and the pandemic kind of messed with that, and I actually ended up in France for about a year and a half. Um, that's but not such a that's not such a punishment. <laughs> yeah, no, it was pretty nice. I mean, it would have been nice to speak French, but um, it was it was lovely. And while I was there, I took a lot of time to study theater in the UK um, and producing in the UK. And um, and now I'm at a point where I'm now back in New York City and trying to maintain uh, both a career in New York and connections in the UK and, and further abroad. So I would consider myself an international uh, producer, freelance producer, and I am uh, an independent producer as well, producing my own work, new work and uh, events that encourage participate participation and um, creating safe spaces for artists to thrive in. And you've actually, if, if you go to Megan's web, website, you'll see that she's been connected with five or six different companies uh, over the past couple year or so, or a couple of years. Uh, so do you want to, do you want to tell us any about those, uh, those or? Yeah, I, uh, sure. Well, I work for Yonder Window Theatre Company, which is a theatre company based in New York, but has presence across North America. And we've done projects across North America. Um, but when I was in the when I was in France, I, I say when I was in the UK, I was in France and I was virtually in the UK. Um, I, I worked with a new writing company in Manchester, UK called Box of Tricks, um, and I've helped develop a fledgling company in London called the Widely Theatre. Um, during the pandemic to help them move online. And um, yeah, I, I, I love the fact that you had a company called Wild, the Wildly, what, what, what was it, Wildly? Wildly. 
yes, company. Wildly theater. Because my my LLC is wildly productive productions. I love the word wildly. <laughs> I wildly seems to just, just... It if they Googled you and they were like, that's different. Uh, <laughs> I came on board a little after they'd started. Um, but yeah, that's funny. No, I just I basically I, I wildly is the 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 uh, the adjective I use to consider how busy I always am. <laughs> That's great and very accurate. <laughs> um, so Chris, uh, tell us a little bit about your background um, and why you why you do what you do now. Certainly, yeah. So I've worked in in the theatre business all my life, um, variously running theatres or festivals in the UK. Um, I I had a little detour for five years working for Cameron McIntosh on his international productions, uh, doing Blame Is and Miss Saigon in places all over the world, which was great fun. Um, but then, the focus of my life really for about twenty years or slightly longer was in the new musical theatre world. Uh, I, I started the first festival of musicals in the UK. I was part of NAMPT, uh, National Arts and Musical Theatre, and um, was one of the judges on the festival each year over some time it's organized conferences in the uk jointly with NAMPT and with uh, tish um, sarah schlesinger and her colleagues at tish so i spent a lot of time developing uh trying to develop the network for new musical theater in the uk uh, which is very much an art form that dare not speak its name sometimes um, and i founded a network which i will put the link into uh, now a, a, a little later on for you uh, because there's an organization called Musical Theatre Network, which is the equivalent, I suppose, of NAMPT in, uh, in the UK. Uh, and it runs a festival of new work. And so I'll put some links in there. Uh, for the last few years, I have realized that there is a need for the nurturing and development of producers uh, across all uh, live art forms. And I first of all created a master's program in the UK, a, a drama school called Mountview Theatre School in London. Um, and then when the pandemic came, uh, I realized that going into a classroom wasn't going to happen for a while and uh, invented um, an institute. Uh, you're looking at the complete office and the complete staff at this very minute. Um, ah, and yes. <laughs> started a, um, a, a diploma in creative producing, uh, which I was lucky enough to have Megan on uh, in November of last year, which was fantastic. And so that happens twice a year. It's a 16 week program. And alongside that, we develop uh, networks for producers. So my interest is in the next generation of creative producers, those people who are going to manage to get shows on in our new world, uh, both blended and in theatres. So Megan, you you also have an initiative for for networking people. Is it the same as Chris's? Or is it is does it overlap with Chris's? Or do you both yeah. have your your individual? Yeah, actually, so Chris, I took Chris's course November of last year. Um, and as we came to the end of the course, the whole cohort felt really strongly that we wanted to continue connecting with each other and learning from each other, but also extending a reach out to other emerging producers and helping them and being resources for each other. Um, so we started a collective called The Fifth Producer, which is uh, just exactly what it is, just a collective of emerging producers that ask each other for help, that connect with each other on, we have a Slack channel. Um, we had uh, meetings. We're currently on a, a hiatus right now, taking a break while everyone does some projects, but we'll be coming back with some more meetings, potentially and like a mix as well in person and online. But our biggest aim was coming out of this virtual um, kind of learning environment where we had people from the US, people from um, the Netherlands, people all over the UK helping each other and learning from each other and encouraging each other that we wanted to stay as connected as possible. And um, it's, it's really lovely. Mostly right now, the, the group is a very UK uh, predominant group. But like I said, we have people from all over and definitely have goals to extend that reach out. So I'm still not clear. Chris, that's not that 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 is an offshoot, but not necessarily the same as, as your initiative right now to, to network yeah, it's people. A, it's a, a, a wonderful initiative because it brings together nine creative producers from three stroke four countries, I think at the moment, uh, who are who know each other and they've built a trust over a period of time. 
Um, and they're also reaching out to other producers then to join them and work with them. So I think it's, it's a bond between uh, aspiring and emerging producers. Uh, it's more like we'll... a support, ours is like a support network for people coming out of programs like Chris's or Mount View or Central or just starting on their own and not really sure how to make it work without going to school. And so Chris has really kind of inspired us through the course that we took with him. The whole cohort then went forward and decided to continue this support network that we had naturally formed while taking the course. So how, how would the people in the room be part of your networking group? Um, do they do they qualify? Do they have to do something? Do they have to take a course? I mean, I, you, we have like, I mean, there's so many different networks right now. There's a pr producer's pool, which Chris runs. There's, uh, you know, the courses that Chris does, which automatically kind of you're now in this network of supportive. Like artists. it or not, you're in the network. Yeah, you're there. You're in the family. <laughs> Um, and then something like uh, the fifth producer, really, it's, we have a website. Like I said, we have a Slack channel. It's really just something if you want to engage with us on social media, on Slack, on the website, you can, anyone can go and do that and be a part of it. It's not something anyone has to qualify for, um, especially like the, the Slack channel. It's for a lot of like asking questions and um, asking, hey, has anyone done this before? And really feeling like it's, it could be a trusted environment because we're all there openly and honestly just trying to help each other out and support each other so sort of like what we do yeah okay um uh, one maybe, of the we, things maybe we can we work do. together yeah. I, Bob, Bob, one of the things that i was very lucky to take on about uh, six years ago now um uh, there is a there's a very short course run by the society of london theater the equivalent of the league over uh, with you uh which is called stage one which is a three-day course on commercial producing um, run by something that was originally called the Theatre Investment Fund. Um, the, a group of those producers who came out of the course realised that they, they were going to go away and be very lonely, having just got to know each other. So they started something called Producers Pool, which was initially just 10 people, I think it was, who met in a, in a bar and talked to each other. And over the years, it grew a little bit. And then they began to drift away. And in 2015, I took it over as a potential network to grow. And Producers Pool is, um, is not a training ground, uh, is not formal, it costs no membership, and producers are now joining it in order that they can do a little bit uh, similar to this with True, is meet each other. And so for the last six years, I've run a monthly meeting for producers. We've got now around about 650 producers who are in the network. Um, and anything from 20 to 50 people turn up at a meeting. Um, and now because of Zoom, uh, for the last year and a half, they've been coming from all over the world. Maybe they usually work in the UK or want to work in the UK. But Why does now this all sound so familiar? <laughs> I know, it does sound familiar. <laughs> but we tried something different, Bob, which was on Wednesday of this week, we had our normal meeting. But because we're now able to move slightly back into rooms again, we did a hybrid meeting, uh, which I've this I want to hear about because we're, we're, we're talking about doing hybrid and I haven't really figured out a, a, a cost effective way of doing it yet. Well, there, I'll tell I'll, I'll tell you what we did very briefly, because it might be useful to other people running workshops. Uh, we um, found a space and Clapham Omnibus, lovely uh, small art centre um, in uh, southwest London, and some of us arrived there all with our laptops and other people were in New York. There were New York producers with us. There were people from around the globe who were on Zoom. We all logged onto Zoom simultaneously and started the meeting on Zoom. And then when, uh, whenever we did breakout rooms, in some people who were just on Zoom broke out into the Zoom rooms and had connections and had conversations about the future of theater. And others who were in Clapham Omnibus moved to tables around Clapham Omnibus and talked uh, in, in the flesh, as it were. Uh, and then we all came back onto Zoom. So we were making it a Zoom event, but with some live or flesh, flesh connections as well. Uh, so that, that seemed to work quite well. And we're going to try that in, uh, on the, uh, look at my notes, on the uh, 27th, of, the 27th of October, isn't it? Uh, we're going to be trying it in New York with uh, a gathering 
room in New York, a gathering room in London, and everybody on Zoom. And I'll see how it all works. So the gathering room, you're going to have a videographer in there, or you're just going to use Just Zoom? bring your laptop. Just, just bring, bring your It worked. It was a bit clunky, but oh. it worked. Bring your laptop into this bar that we take, we're going to be in for a while. Uh, bring your laptop. Everybody sits with their headphones on, so they're not interrupting each other too much. And we all go on Zoom, and then we all go and buy each other a drink, or we go mm. into a breakout room. And then we okay. come back again. And it worked quite well. Okay, so that's something that we might want to consider. San I think Sandy, my board chair, is here. I hope he's listening to this. Um, so let me, let me ask you this. You're, um, Megan, I'm going to start with you. Um, you. You've spent time producing in London and also in, in New York. You, you, you've done it both places. Can you, can you talk about the spe specifically what some of the differences are and where you feel more comfortable as a producer? I'm going to ask yeah. Chris the same thing. Um, yeah, and I would say that I've, um, I wouldn't count out like the whole UK either. You know, there's a lot of like amazing theater happening all over the UK. And um, I think that the, the country sends, London definitely has a, uh, its own life, just like New York. Um, but I, I mean, I guess the, the biggest differences would be probably the, the fringe level of theater in general. Um, that exists in the UK and the amount of funding that you can get to produce work in the UK is the major difference that I noted, um, not just when I was training, but then when I was working, there's just a lot more possibility to really rest your entire career on just producing theater and uh, the the money can is there more readily uh, from by the government. Uh, there's something called the Arts Council there, which some of you may know and some of you may not know, but um, you can get apply for funding and it's just much, much easier to get funding for work. And so, so let, let's just spill that out. One of the big, big differences between there and here is that in the United States, there is virtually no support of the arts. There's virtually no government supporting a support of the arts. I mean, there are things here and there, but it's it's nothing, nothing conscious. <laughs> yeah. uh, um, and in uh, in the UK, you actually have Chris. You can uh, agree or disagree with this. You actually have a government that that consciously supports the arts. And we, yeah, actively. we have a regional. We we have we're fortunate since the since the Second World War, uh, there has been funding for the arts, um, specifically where it is. It's for not for profit arts so it's for education work it's for community work it's for it's for regional theatres uh, so some of that comes from the arts council of england or scotland or other countries within the great within great britain and some of it still comes from local authorities just as indeed in cities across the usa supporting the arts in their own community as well um, and what we found in the last i suppose 20 30 years is a much closer connection between the subsidized theatres uh, and the West End. And most or many of the shows that now open in the West End start in a, in, in a regional house, which has some government funding attached to it. Um, so many, many musicals come out of Plymouth Theatre Royal, for example, uh, Martin Platt, um, uh, Lem Mia Tenor, um, started out of there and went into the West End. Yeah, Martin. So, I try, uh, Martin was. I wanted to have with you today. He was sorry that he wasn't able to make it. I'm going to have to come have him in a future. Well, uh, that's because he's at the sh he's at shows in. He's sitting in a theatre at this very moment in London. So uh, <laughs> that's, right. that's uh, why I couldn't do it. But uh, um, and if you look back at, for example, Les Misérables, um, that came out of Royal Shakespeare Company, funded by the government, effectively, and Cameron Mackintosh in collaboration. Um, Matilda um, came out of the same place. War Horse tra traveling all over the world came out of the National Theatre. All these have government subsidy behind them at the beginning of their R&D phase or their first production. And that synergy has continued and that con connection has continued uh, to really dominate the West End now. Uh, we're very okay. lucky from that point of view. Uh, yeah, <laughs> pardon, pardon us if we're a little envious. Um, <laughs> so, what are the what what other differences are there in terms of producing in London versus here? And Chris, 
have you have you produced in, in New York? Have you ever had a an, an no, idea I of producing here? I, no, I haven't. I haven't produced shows in in New York. I've I've worked on the development of work. I've helped to bring shows into the NAMP Festival and Nymph Festival, um, and so I've I've been connected into productions that have been happening, um, and some of the lovely Forty Second Street theatres as they were. Um, but no, I haven't produced myself. Um, but what are the differences? For me, uh, one of the key differences is that um, the unions are lighter touch in the UK and maybe more understanding of off, off West End. Um, and we can, we can have, for example, actors working together on a development reading totally off an equity contract, not on an equity contract at all. They don't require that, it there. That would be required in the in the US, yeah. but not required in the UK. You don't get away with it with musicians quite so easily. Um, so that's one advantage. We have a the disadvantage with the definitely within the London scene is that we have off off West End theatres and we have West End theatres, but we have very few off West End theatres, if you're thinking in terms of size. Uh, we've got tons of pub theatres and theatres at the back of a room and theatres above something and theatres in cellars, lots and lots of them. But the moment you want a theatre that's two to 300 seats, that is a, not a West End house, not a, a, a salt house, that becomes a real challenge. And you have a great advantage, just as, just as uh, Seoul does uh, in Korea, fantastic advantage of having many, many theatres that are um, on that middle scale. I'm not sure we have that many here, but we have some. Um, Grass is always greener on your uh -oh. side. Yeah, right. Um, I just want to encourage the room to um, raise your hand or, or uh, you know, if you want to make a comment or I'm looking in the, in the, um, in the chat, I'm seeing James Simon is questioning, you're saying the center of the theater universe. He, he said he's ready for that debate. Um, um, James, do you want to say anything to that? Well, I mean, I was being a little snide there, but yeah, I mean, look, to to Chris's point, yes, we have a lot of one. The one advantage that we do have here is a lot of not-for-profit off-Broadway theaters, or even at this point coming out of the pandemic, are doing some pretty remarkable <laughs> work, and I think there's going to be a, a strong urge to get more of that stuff, not necessarily to Broadway, but I think as more audiences come in and rediscover the off-Broadway theaters, uh, especially with BIPOC plays being done, I think we can be in for something that's really quite extraordinary in the next few months. That's all. <laughs> okay, good enough. Um, question, um, how how do uh, the, the people in 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 um, in my in my group, my our our American writers, how do they make connections in London? Um, who would what would they do? What would the steps be? Um, well, I'm making I'm gonna, asking I'm make specifically. A, I'm going to make a flip. I'm going to make a quick answer and then give ask Megan to talk a little bit more. But honestly, the same way you would make connections in any city in in the in the US, it's finding people through the networks that exist and picking up the phone or the Zoom or the email and, and talking with them. And there is a kind of, um, always a bit of a glamour when, when you're having a conversation with somebody from another side of the world. Um, it becomes more an interesting conversation. Megan, go for it. No, yeah, I agree. And I think uh, I would encourage people to, um, so when I was living in France, I knew I wanted to move to the UK. So I did, I just basically put myself there virtually. And I looked at all of the companies that I really wanted to work with or the areas that I wanted to be in. And I would go to like the artist mixer Zooms that they had. And I'd be like, yeah, I'm not there, but I want to work with you there. And I, it was amazing how connected I ended up feeling to a community um, of, of producers and, and artists in specific locations and specific companies even just by you know looking at what virtual events they were hosting and um or people Hello. around Hi, jessica it's sandy silverberg uh, sandy silverberg please mute yourself Hi, how are you I'm okay. sandy silverberg you? please mute yourself 
I'm doing good too. Oh my lord. Okay. Um, I, I can't even find him now. Sandy. Sandy. Because <clears throat> I'm a little bit busy. There he is. <laughs> um, I yeah, have to I, edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> That, that's my recommendation is like, look where you want to meet with people because there are a lot of these Zoom things happening and take advantage because you can, anyone can join them. And and like Chris said, there is something in, oh, like, oh, you're you're from a different place. You like, I want to get to know you, I want to talk to you and um, definitely look at that. Definitely look at coming to the, the producers pools that Chris hosts are very international and, um, and you gave yeah. us links to those? I just, yeah, I can probably put them in again in a bit. Okay. They are up a little bit in the chat. So I wanted, um, I, wanted to, I wanted to fill in a couple blanks for some people that may not know. Um, we talk about off-Broadway theaters. Uh, so there, everything is defined by equity contracts for us here. I mean, it's, I'm sure it's different for you over there, but for us, it's equity contracts. Uh, a showcase uh, happens in a theater that is 99 seats or fewer. Um, anything that's 100 or more and less and fewer than 500 is designated officially in our in our business as an off-Broadway theater. So it's 100 to 499 seats um, in general. I, I'm not sure if anything is slightly changed here or there. I don't know, but that's that's the general rule that we have to abide by. Um, so when you're talking about the abundance of theaters, Chris, you're talking about off. You were actually talking about off-Broadway theaters. Because you were talking about a lot of small spaces in London, we have tons of those here too. We probably have more of those than we have anything else. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I, James put up a German Street Theatre for a perfect example. And German Street is a wonderful, wonderful small theatre space with seventy-five seats. It's right in the heart. It's by Piccadilly Circus. It's right in the heart of West End. Um, and and yet, great, and yet, people do commercial runs at the German. Here, when we have small theaters like that, we we rarely we rarely book commercial runs there, just because the, they do. Uh, they yes, but it uh, it's a pretty challenge in seventy five seats uh, to make it pay, um, but it's a great place to start work and develop work. Um, and we have we have a number of those theaters across London. What we don't really have enough of is where can that German street theatre transfer? And if I've got this right, quite often within uh, within the New York scene, a show would move from a 99-seater to a 250, 300-seater if it's successful and slowly grow itself in a commercial way. I think if I've got that right. Well, actually, we th th there's, an there's another step that, that should be mentioned, which is a, a 99, uh, a showcase or a small show that wants to extend its run can move into what's called a, um, it's not a letter of agreement, somebody help me, what is it called? This is, there's an agreement that they can do that where they can extend in that same theater for another, I think it's six weeks. I don't have all, that's why, this is why I need Martin Platt, because he knows all these details. Uh, a mini contract, thank you, Larry. It's the mini contract. So you can extend to a mini contract. Sometimes it seems foolish to extend um, in a 99 seat theater to a mini contract because it becomes an interim an interim step that's going to require you to do another jump after that if you want to actually start recouping. Um, but uh, so we're talking about a pipeline here. So our pipeline uh, that to commercial production, we have to really include as Amy Stoller keeps reminding me, our regional theaters, we have regional regional theaters that are have become more of the pipeline to commercial production than uh, Off-Broadway is currently. Cur currently, Off-Broadway is a difficult, we had an interesting panel uh, last week or the week, the week, two weeks ago about that, but it's a diff difficult place to, to make a go of it. We have, just so you know, if you don't know this already, uh, one Off-Broadway model that is currently, seems to be working a little bit better than other things, and that is the, uh, periodic performance contract in which you get to share your theater space with other shows. So you're only not booking it for eight performances a week, you're booking it for one to three performances a week. Um, There's a great new initiative that NYMEX Theatres in London is, is moving forward with, which seems to be uh, in, a, in a similar vein, they are now having much smaller shows going into their theatres for a very limited season with some shows happening on a Sunday night or but one show happening on a Monday and, and other shows happening during the week. So they're creating a little bit more of a, a mixed program within theatres that would traditionally have a sit down show for 
one, two or more years. And that's exciting, especially for, for younger producers or newer producers coming through. Um, I just want to respond to it. The, the God, there's, there's floods of things in the chat. Uh, Catherine Hilby is saying something which is true, which is that making the jump to the mini contract costs an enormous amount of money. So you have to really, this all boils down to good producing and, and good planning. Um, it's not a random thing. You just don't throw the spaghetti on the wall and hope it's going to stick. You have to really plan for things. Uh, you have to plan for success as well as plan for um, contingencies and unexpected things. So, um, she, so Katrine, yes, I'm agreeing with you. you you're absolutely right. Um, it, it becomes enormously expensive. It's the reason to do it, as I understand it, is because you think your show might have legs and you might be able to use that period of time after the showcase and during the mini contract to get enough people in and ge generate enough excitement about your piece that you can move it into the next step of development. Um, James is absolutely right about um, the shark is broken coming in as a, on a limited run. That's one of those exciting ones coming through. It came from the same. We also have an incredible opportunity with the Edinburgh Festival. Um, we a number of shows come through that route towards the West End. So six, the uh, the musical about the six wives of Henry VIII uh, started as a student production at Edinburgh uh, in the in one of the fringe theatres, ran for three weeks, lost probably lots of money, but even though it did very well, uh, then got some enhancement money from Andy Barnes and his production company, Global Musicals, went back to Edinburgh uh, in a bigger space, played for three weeks, got a lot of traction and energy, and then came into the Arts Theatre with the backing of Kenny Wax uh, and George Stiles. And so it began to move forward in that way. And, and the shark was also at Edinburgh. I, want, I, want, I wanted to add in an, another model, an off-roadway model that, we, that, that is used today. Basically, that's partnering with a not-for-profit theater company that works out of an off-Broadway theater. Um, we had two hands up. I, I know that, Rand, Randall, you put your hand down, but you've asked qu the question in here. I'd rather hear you ask, ask it than me ask it. So, Randall, come on, come on and turn on your mic and ask your question. Uh, sure. My question was just for Megan. You mentioned, you know, that you've gotten involved in a bunch of different Zoom things with different UK theaters or, or groups. Um, how do you find those? Um, it really is like research. I think like a really big piece of advice is just know, knowing what you want, like figuring out um, if you want to if you're looking to work with a specific type of company in the UK, if you want to work with like a company that does new work you put in the research to figure out what companies are producing new work in the location that you're interested in. So if it's London, looking in London, if it's Manchester or if it's in you know, Scotland somewhere, just get honing in on the goal of like why you wanna connect with someone and then finding as many companies, venues as possible. Like they typically, I mean, it might be dying down a little bit more now, um, but there might still be things going on uh, mailing lists like to be a part of and just look for those very specific people so that's what I did I when I was not living there but wanted to be connected I was like I know I want to I want to know what's going on in Manchester and I figured out the did a lot of research about the venues and the companies that were working there and understood who resonated with me and then kind of dived into what they were offering as far as engagement and art artistic uh, sharing, you know, sessions and things like that and ended up in a lot of networking Zooms and never, I've never been to Manchester, but I know a lot of people there now. <laughs> but where did you specifically find the contact for like the Zooms? I mean, when, if I go well, to... They'll, if they're having them, they'll advertise. Like I know, I know there's still um, quite a few, like in the networks that I was in, they, they still are doing some of these like presentational Zoom things. So you, you have to just kind of look through their, you know, websites and see if they're advertising them if they have them still going on or if not if there is contact information people love that um i think i found in the uk people really love to be reached out to and saying like i'm i'm really interested in what you're doing can i just have a chat with you um like again maybe because covid's ending it might be dying down a bit but i think that there's still a lot of room for people like wanting to have conversations with people they typically wouldn't be able to have conversations with before. I want to and offer, a, a, I want to jump in with a, a, correction, a correction that John Lant made. Uh, the, the periodic uh, performance is one to four performances 
the specifically the contract that let, lets you do one to four performances a week and share your space with another another show. Uh, we have a whole lineup of questions. Okay, can Chris? I just well, add one other thing for Randall? If, if you're, I didn't quite catch uh, whether you're producing musical theatre or or straight drama, but if it's musical theatre, then um, then musical theatre network is a network that has a website, has a membership list. You can see that I put the link up in the chat. Um, and that is a network of producers and theatres and programmers and, and agents and various other people who specifically are passionate about the development of musical theatre. And then we also have something called the UK Theatre, which is um, uh, used to be called the TMA, Theatrical Management Association. It's a management body that has a contract with equity and the other unions as well. Uh, but that membership is quite an interesting one to explore. And I think Megan's right. People are very friendly and will will pass you on to interesting networks and people. Uh, you just have to start the process of, of asking the first person. I think. I, really, that is it. Like, And even going to Chris's producer's pool, if you put something out there saying, I'm wanting to connect with people here, the specific kind of person I'm looking to connect with, you know, London-based producers of new straight plays, whatever, somebody in the chat might hit you up. I mean, it's very likely. And it can go from there. If they don't know someone that's, if they aren't right for you, they might know someone who's, who's right to chat with you. And just kind of getting the ball rolling is is the biggest thing you can do. Well, the two, the two secrets to good networking are, first of all, letting people know what you want. And second of all, being interested in what they want. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we've got, we've got hands raised. So I, I want to go to Larry and then Eric Jones. So Larry, uh, you, come in, come in and, and ask your question. And then hey we're guys, going to go to some, I'm going to go to the questions. I'm not forgetting the questions that are in the chat. I will get to them, I promise. Hey guys, thank you so much for being here. This is very helpful. Uh, here in the States, if you have a new show that you want to play at a regional theater and see how it works for three weeks or whatever, the producers have to set up a percentage deal with that theater. So if the show moves to a co uh, commercial production in the future, that theater will receive a percentage of all the royalties. I was curious because you mentioned earlier that in the UK, the government often gives money to the regional theaters, such as with Les Mis, and then that show could move to the West End. Does the government expect any sort of percentage in the future, or do they just give that gratis and say, go with God, and we don't expect anything, and just have a good time? Uh, brilliant question. Bizarrely, they don't want any back. And there have been conversations over many years going, why don't you? You should have some money back, because if the Arts Council of Great Britain, as it was then, which funded the Royal Shakespeare Company, had got a tiny, tiny slice of uh, the money coming back from Les Mis, uh, then it would have lots more money to fund other arts projects. But at the moment, Arts Council England doesn't uh, invest in any shows. Um, there's talk about that changing, but at the moment it gives money to its regional houses. The regional houses then put on theatre. Um, and the regional house may get a tiny cut back uh, if they've, if they've developed a show. So Larry, you didn't mention enhancement money from the producers. Are you talking about uh, situations where the producer doesn't have to put in, I don't know of any, any, oh, any no, no, situation. No, no, no. The, the producer puts in money, but the okay. theater theoretically puts in money too, and they expect something back in the future. I was saying in this case, in, in the UK, the Arts Council is being that person that they're, right. they're like the theater, but they don't expect anything back, which is gorgeous. Mm -hmm. So my question is, how soon can I move to the UK? That's the next question. There you go. I, I mean, after, <laughs> after Megan. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Eric Jones. Uh, yes, hi. Um, uh, I do have a, 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 a songwriting uh, partner that is actually from the UK. He's a, a composer, and we're actually uh, have a show. Um, we, we, we're in the process of actually working on a show that actually takes place in the UK. Would that be more advantage, particularly for an American who's actually not from that, from you know, from um, you know, you're not from Britain, to basically you know be able to apply to like the the Arts Council to have funding for a show, or or, or does it really matter what type of subject matter or what, what country or, you know the um, the creative um, team is from? You have to be a UK taxpayer to apply to the Arts Council in England, um, but uh, or UK resident, whichever way around it is. But um, that doesn't mean you can't have partners who come from other countries. I'm currently working on a project and being paid for a project. I'm obviously in the US and a US citizen, not a UK citizen. And I'm working with a UK citizen who has done the 
bid was rewarded the money and is now paying as that artist paying freelancers too. So piggybacking on that question, Patricia wants to know, are producing entities in the UK interested in shows written by Americans? That's a pretty They're interested in good question. Shows. They're interested in good shows that will play to um, the, the, the right audience in the UK. So I, I think it's the topic and the, and the audience demographic that you're likely to get. It, I don't think anybody minds what, what nationality the writer is. Yeah. It's true. I mean, I actually, I had advice from Martin Platt ages ago in the middle of the pandemic, I was talking to him about a show and I was like, it's really depressing. And he's like, I don't know if Broadway's going to want depressing for a while, but the UK, they might want some depressing stuff. It's so, all cultural, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, I think it's like, Chris is entirely right. And we have a, we have a number of, of writers that I keep hearing from who are writing uh, wonderful books which have e they're either um, books of musicals based on um, 19th, a sort of Jane Austen kind of world, or they're books based on tartan and kilts. And every time I hear some of those shows and topics, I, I actually feel they work better in a US theatre than they do in a UK theatre, because the interest for uh -huh. that period of history in the UK is not as strong as it might be elsewhere in the world. Um, so there's, th it works both ways. There are sometimes there's a show written by British writers that actually would work better in Korea or in uh, in Australia or in, in the USA. I will say too, like I, I had a play that was written in the US for US audiences and I did, there was a lot of debate about whether or not I should turn it into a British play like it's it was something that could easily be done and I think that is also something if you want to have a premiere in the UK of a new show then considering would this work it better if it's you know reflective of culture like I think that you can you can practice that and even if if you are in the UK you can even get funding you can apply for arts council funding and do an R&D based on should this be an American family or should this be a British family and how can how is that going to work and could I partner with a writer who would help me with cultural references and things like that? Okay. One of the key things I think that is a real difference between the UK and the US is that the industry in the US, as far as I can see, respects musical theatre as a fantastic art form. Uh, and in the UK, still, it is seen as not quite as important an art form as plays. We don't have any new development play house, um, musical theatre houses that are totally de dedicated to musical theatre. Um, we do have playhouses like the Royal Court and like the Travis Theatre um, that are dedicated to new plays. But we don't have that for musical theatre yet. Mm -hmm. I, look at, I look at it okay. slightly different. I, just, I look at it as basically uh, London has as much musical theatre as, as, as New York has. However, they, they have more, more non-musical than, than we tend to get. Um, they're a little bit more open, a little bit. They're a lot more open to straight plays than, than we are here. Our audiences just don't flock to straight plays. So I, that I see is what the, what the difference is. So, somebody started to ask a question. Is, or did I miss, miss that? Or is that just somebody randomly unmuting themselves? I do think Amy is correct. We need to keep a track of how many times Martin is mentioned, Martin yeah. Platt is mentioned. Um, um, I think that we should put a dollar, we should give a dollar to True for every time Martin Platt is mentioned. <laughs> Um, the, you asked the two, uh, just you asked me to say the names of the two organizations again, certainly. Um, th there is a network called Musical Theatre Network, MTN, uh, which is an, a, an association, a club, whatever, of uh, people who are dedicated to the development of musical theatre, but are not writers. So they're the producers, the directors, people like that. And there is a sister body called Mercury Musical Development, uh, which is the equivalent network for writers, which is for UK developmental writers. Um, and Mercury Musical Development came out of uh, Sondheim workshops that happened in 1980, 1992, 1988, can't remember exactly, but a long time ago. And uh, that then formed Mercury Workshop. This Mer a Mercury actually produces workshops. They, they do workshops of shows. Uh, they do a, a, a showcase festival 
uh, of new work called the BEAM Festival, as in pointing light. Uh, it's not an acronym, it just, um, just means a light. Oh, somebody, uh, somebody, somebody can make it into an acronym. B-E-A-M, everyone, there's your challenge. Yeah. Um, and and that's M, just M, M is for musical. So I sat in, in the Hackney Empire last, uh, last month and saw 35 musicals in a day, um, or bits of 35 musicals in a day. And I think I'm just about recovering slowly. <laughs> Now you you've mentioned earlier that you you you've been connected with both National Alliance of Music Theaters, which is NAMT, and also uh, the the now belated Nymph uh, New York Music Theater Festival. Um, yeah. So uh, we've talked about this. We both know Chris Stewart, who uh, actually came to came to me. Chris Stewart, who started Nymph. For those of you who don't know, his first contacts in his first contacts with aliens, his, his first contacts in, in New York were, were was a true meeting. That's how he found his way into the into the New York network through True. So um, I just want to just take my bragging rights on that, if you don't mind. Absolutely. And, well, Chris is an extraordinary being, and what he and and Isaac managed to create over the years with with uh, Nymph was absolutely fantastic. I told you, um, I said this to you. Chris is I, on our faculty. Um, I said this to you before. I never understood when he first sat down to meet with me and told me what he wanted to do, why it had to be the biggest music festival in, in the world. I thought that, he was barking he, mad. <laughs> when I first had a conversation with him at NAMP about it, I thought he was completely barking mad and he proved us all wrong, which is fantastic. But it's, it's, I, I, still, I still wonder why the biggest? Why not just because the Because he got the most attention. It got okay. the most attention, and that's what it kind of needed to get the Nederlanders and everybody else to go. Yeah, we'll we'll support it. Um, we have a vote for best best ever artistic musicals. Beam, <laughs> British emerging artists of musical theatre. Well, that's beamed. That's the same problem we have with nymphed. Yes, uh, and nymphed. We took the F oh. out of nymph. Keep them, keep them coming, and I'll pass them on to James <laughs> Rums for. Runs beam. So, um, any other questions from the room? Anything you guys would like to say uh, as an well, enticement to get people to become more involved yeah, with your networks? Yeah, I, um, I, I just want to say because as Bob, you said, um, you know, the way to network is to start by saying what you want uh, and then listening. And so, I just would like to say what I want. Uh, I'm looking at the moment for. Uh, probably younger emerging producers who are interested in exploring the training of, of being a producer, potentially working in the UK or Europe. Um, because we've got this 16 week program, which is, can be accessed anywhere in the world. And I'm really looking to try and uh, grow the international network of producers who work together and create um, the equivalent of fifth producer. So if there's anyone that you know around the world that might be in any way interested in, in being part of a training program for producers that they can't go to New York to take or they can't go to London to take, uh, then please let me know because I would be really interested in, in talking to them. Tracking, uh, what, oh, Jane Dubin is asking, what is the cost? Uh, the cost of the course, the 16 week course is £2,800, which is a, probably about 3200 ish. It's a, it's a little bit more than what we charge. And that's 16 weeks, um, two days a week. Um, solid, yeah. Uh, James Simon wants to know what exactly will be happening with the 1023 meeting. And I think you said a different date, and John Lance said it was the 23rd. He, he says it, it's, on, it is, it's on. It's the 27th. I think might be wrong on the website. But oh, it's it October, is the 27th, not the 23rd. Yeah, um, October 27th. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and so, it's, um, yeah, it's going to be like a hybrid in person and on Zoom meeting between hopefully producers in um, New York and uh, all over the world, but specifically connecting with producers in the UK. You said you're having UK producers in a room as well, Chris, is that? That's my hope. So you're in a room, you're in a room in New York. I would be there, but we're not allowed to come in yet. Uh, so you're in on the ground in New York with a group of people, hopefully 
uh, with laptops. I'll be in the, on the ground in London uh, with a group of producers who are up for being around there. And uh, we may also have a meeting happening in Edinburgh uh, potentially as well. And then we'll all get online and we'll have conversations online and connect to each other in breakout rooms and everything else. That's the plan. I, I may have missed, missed this. Uh, Megan, are, are you finding the venue in, in, in New York or are you looking for somebody to, to make this happen in New York? Uh, no, I mean, I will be there uh, helping run it in New York um, with probably a co-host of some kind. Um, we, ha we have what, a venue. You yeah. have a venue, what is the venue? Uh, the venue at the moment, um, anybody can come up with a better one, uh, is bar nine on uh, 9th between 53rd and 54th. Bar nine. Okay. Um, I'll Which give it some record. thought. So you're basically looking for a bar venue, right? Yeah. For, and that's, what, that's ready to go 2 till 4 p.m. An opportunity for people to meet who may be producers who haven't met in person for a very long time because of COVID. Uh, and then being able to be online and connect with a group of producers and aspiring creatives in London as well. Larry wants you to clarify the name of your 16 week course is, is a, the a, producer's it, pool? A diploma in creative producing. Oh, diploma in creative pr producing, CGO it's Institute. It's a 16 week course and I'll just put the link up again. Uh, just in answer to that. And if there's two intakes, one in uh, on the 1st of November, and then a second intake on the looking up across the room on the 11th of April of next year. Yeah, so, so 16 weeks. Um, is each each week dedicated to a specific area of development uh, for producers? There are six main modules. Some take two weeks, some take four weeks. So we look at budgeting. We look at the arts ecology across the world. Uh, we look at marketing. We look at... Uh, legal and team building and leadership sort of of organizations. Uh, <coughs> fundraising. Um, Raising yeah, money. Th so there's the main areas. Right. And the production process. And we, uh, but in, in the main that we spend uh, a little bit less time on because so many people are already producing projects or developing projects. And, and there is, there's a faculty of 20 uh, lecturers who work with us. Um, and uh, October 27th, it's two to four here in New York, and it's going to be five to, what is that? Five it's to seven nine. Seven to nine in, in, seven till nine in. Seven in, to nine, in, yeah. Yeah. Five, five, five hour difference. Five plus yeah. two and, is seven. You know, obviously delighted if people from the West Coast want to zoom in with us, uh, or indeed set up a little meeting in on the West Coast in the morning. Um, and it's open and, to anyone, um, just to answer the question that just popped up in the chat. Do we have a, a like a sign up link for that one yet, Chris? We do. Uh, you you talk uh, about it, and I will go and find it. Yep. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it would be a great opportunity for producers pool to meet true, as well, and uh, those who are curious about New York theater over in the UK because there are many of them. I get lot. I got lots and lots of questions about musicals when I was taking Chris's course and networking a lot in the UK, and I'm not necessarily a musicals person and. I was like, I wish I knew who to talk, tell you to talk to, but maybe this is a great opportunity <laughs> to uh, connect. Oh, one of the people who will be joining the course is an Australian and UK uh, producer of musical theatre and developer of musical theatre, and that's exciting for us. And uh, yes, yeah, so I've just put up the link uh, to a book to be on this meeting. Um, I think the thing I would say about Producers Pool, which is the networking network, is that we don't want to do anything anybody else is doing. And, you know, true is extraordinary. And what you've done, Bob, and your colleagues, uh, you know, founded with you, what you've done over the years with true is absolutely incredible. And just look at the body of work that you're doing in terms of supporting new producers and giving them incredible information and knowledge and, and opportunity to, to shake, shake themselves up and work out what they are. That's absolutely incredible. There's no- Thank you. You know, the point is to collaborate with you and and be a supportive network across the pond, as it were. So, what can I do? What can I what can I do? Is true to 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 work with you guys? Well, I think you should write some work. 
I think you should follow the recommendation of your colleague to get, to get stuck into some writing. Um, no, in all honesty. Um, you mean finish my ask, damn play? Um, obviously, we're interested in, in producers who are, who are interested in working internationally. I think that's that's where producers pool is is has got real potential. It's just meeting people so that um, you know. We we pick up on that problem that someone that Randall I think you were saying was how do I how do I meet someone well if you happen to be in the bar on on the Wednesday the twenty seventh there's a chance you'll meet someone who will, may not be the right person but they may give you the next person to talk to and that's what we can do yep uh, basically the bit one of the basic tenets of 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 theatre that I try to impress on people is people produce people they know um, mm. more often than not. So networking is a huge part of this business as well as any other business. Yeah. Um, if you don't think you're good at networking, I'm not sure what to tell you. You can't really hire you can't hire somebody to network for you. I mean, I understand like somebody saying, "Oh, I'm not good at raising money." Okay, you can get a producing partner who can raise money better than you can. But networking is a skill that we all need to acquire and develop. I, I, there is a danger in what you say, Bob. I 100% I agree with you that that we produce people we know. I think we also tend to work with people we know. And one of the dangers in our industry, uh, definitely in the UK industry o over the last too long, is that we tend to be very white, very middle class, um, very uh, aware of the people we know, very privileged. Oh, yes. And there's a shock to the system that that isn't the whole population of the UK. And there's an enormous emphasis now, and absolutely rightly so, on trying to make sure we don't just work with people we know, but we work with people we don't know. And well, we I think it's also part part of the part of the <laughs> equation is for is for us to know more people, people outside yeah. of outside of our cultural circle, and yeah. that's actually one of the one of the initiatives that True is working on right now. We're we're going to be doing a um, a BIPOC uh, conversation on October twenty third. Um, it's going to be the first of, of quarterly conversations that we're going to be talking about in terms of uh, what what we all what we all can do to increase the, the visibility of of, non, the, the, of the non white theater artist. Um, so we're we're aware of that. When I talk about people producing people that they know, that that also includes getting to know people other, other than the people that are that look like you. Um, yeah. That was never an assumption that I made. No, no, I, I absolutely honour that. Um, I do think back to the fact that, that we've just had a little vote um, to become an island uh, unattached to almost the rest of the world. Um, the, what was called the Brexit vote, uh, whereby we decided to leave Europe and all sensible connections with Europe. Um, and, you know, the vote was 50-50, more or less. And I didn't know a single person anywhere who voted to leave. So I... Quite clearly, I only know half the population of the UK or people who represent half the population. Well, yeah, we feel the same way here. We feel like we, we only know half the population of the US. We don't understand a, 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 about 70 million people. We, don't, we, we just have no idea what's going on. We, we don't get it. Um, and I think it's important for us to get it. I think it, we can't dismiss them. Um, we have to understand them and we have to um, try to understand why they do what they do and why they think the way they think. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean we have to like it, but um, <laughs> it's a, it's a worldwide challenge right now. It's not uh, just US. It's not just UK. It's actually everywhere. Uh, the populations are more noticeably splitting um, along uh, ideological lines in in a way that I don't think I've ever noticed in my entire lifetime. Elwise asked an, an, an interesting question, which is um, how about plays with music and how are they treated? Um, I think one of the things that's really interesting for me is that now that I live in Scotland, um, uh, is that here in Scotland, we have a much um, healthier in a sense relationship to music. Um, and most of the plays that have been produced over the last 30, 40 years in, in this country uh, have music within them. They'll have live musicians, they'll have everything else uh, that, that gives them a kind of musicality, which comes from, in a sense, the soul of the Scottish people. Uh, similarly true in Wales, I think, but less so in England. Um, but having said that, the plays with music absolutely welcomed uh, 
and it's then a very interesting thing is is how does the marketing officer decide or the marketing company decide to market it are they going to market it as a play or as a musical and they're very different market uh, market uh, campaigns that uh, it, it is complicated when you have a play with music um we have a musicals reading series we have a play reading series where does it fit um mm. we we have the problem if it's a play with music and the music is essential in our play reading series, we're not budgeted for for music. Um, but if we're doing our musicals reading series and it's not really a, a, a piece where the where the storyline is moved by the songs or the or the music, then it the, the, it sticks out for the readers. It doesn't look like it doesn't look like what they think of as a musical. Um, mm -hmm. It's hard, but there are. I always tell people, don't worry about who doesn't relate to what you do just look for the people that do basically find the places where, who actually un understand and embrace what you're doing um I i'm just curious to see whether there are any more questions i don't see any more questions in the room did i miss anybody um connor did i miss anybody do, do, do you do you see anything that i may have missed because uh, we can do now uh, if, if you guys can stay i know it's late where you are How, what time is it now all right five past eleven He's a I, don't go, I don't go to bed until 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 three, so th that doesn't sound late to me. But we like to do breakout rooms, so if if you want, you can actually start meeting people. Oh, Paul, did you have a, a question? I see a hand. I, I just want to make a small small comment in praise of English theater. My uh, ant, ant, little anti-Trump play, although it's since been done at the Goodman and in New York and Portland and a few other places. It was first a little theater in Sheffield, England that did it and got it and got all the Trumps up before anybody, any theater in America did. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Brilliant. So I'm, I'm going to put us into breakout rooms, um, if, those of you who want to meet meet each other. And I hope a lot of you do. This entire meet, meeting today was about networking. So it would be like horrible if you didn't want to network. So take advantage of the opportunity to meet people. I'm going to do breakout rooms. Actually, I have to say the farewell to the YouTube visitors first. Um, I want to thank everybody for being here today. I want to thank Chris and I want to thank Megan for being here and sharing sharing with us uh, what you're doing and how we can how we can do it too. Um, and um, I want to also remind everybody that we do this: pay what you can, and pay what you can is often nothing. I understand that. However, if it could be something, it'll keep us going a little bit more uh, easily. Um, so don't hesitate to donate if you want at truedonate.com, trudonate.com. Uh, Ralph Lewis may have told you that we, we have the option of you making a small donation monthly um, if, if you want to. Uh, so uh, that would be great to have somebody who would join us on a monthly basis and give us five or ten dollars or five or ten dollars a week or a month that would be great and everything helps so don't take us for granted we're doing well we're we're healthy we're strong we're here and we're doing this with you and we're doing the things for you now don't take us for granted because it, it it's got to the money has to keep coming in somehow so uh that's it and uh thank you to my youtube viewers out there uh would love to have you come and join us here in the room. Uh, so Fridays at 4.30, uh, be a part of these conversations and be a part of the, of the community. Uh, you can email me at trunltd at aol.com and uh, use Zoom in your, in your subject line in a way that will make me laugh. Or just put it in there, just so I know it's for, it's for the Zoom, okay? So thanks, everyone. Um, so. I uh, invite everybody to turn your videos on and come back into the room. Uh, I'm going to change my video settings so that I can see the non-video participants. Uh, and I'm going to make breakout rooms where you're going to be able to, to choose the breakout room you want to go into. Um, Chris, uh, I'm going to put you in breakout room one so people can come and meet you. And Megan, I'm going to put you in breakout room two so people can come and meet, meet you. Um, Jane Dubin, I'm going to put you in breakout room three. So let's see. I'm going to make five breakout rooms in all. So you have the option of also just getting your own group together and going into a room. Um, Vinny, Vinny, you have, you, have, you have your hand raised. I didn't say, see that. What did you want to ask? Well, and I'm too late probably, but um, 
Okay, you're talking about uh, plays in the UK that relate, uh, you know, across the pond. I had heard once that um, as we like plays about the UK or something like American history, I'm in the South, I have a play about, you know, a rhythm darlings about something during World War II in the South. Is that like, isn't there some interest for some American history, especially racial? Or is that only strictly yeah. American? Megan, what's, you, what's your feeling? I've got a thought. Um, I mean, I, I think it's, I think it depends on, I think it depends on producing house or the company that is interested in what their mission is and goal is. I think, you know, I think there's definitely interest. And I think even from what, uh, who was it? Paul was just saying that he had a play go up in Sheffield about Trump, but there's there's definitely an interest in American culture and American history. Uh, it's just yeah, finding the right the right people who who might be interested in doing it might just be a kind of a hunt to, to right. Who might yeah, be and it may it may be not in necessarily the West End tourist houses as it were, um, but it may be one of those theatres in London uh, that has a policy for developing new work and presenting new work from around the world. Or it could be a centre like Manchester, which has a very, very large black community and a very strong uh, relationship uh, with black black writing and global majority writing. Um, I think so, like on that note, like I, I think there's everywhere in, in the um, predominantly like white spaces, there is a need for the conversations and the um, work by artists of colour and everything. I think you know, UK is also having that moment for themselves too. So there might be more work by uh, black artists that are based in the UK happening right now, um, rather than seeing lots of stories about America. But I do think that it's really relevant and it would be something that people would be interested in. Um, but it's just something to keep in mind. All right, I thank to, you. I, I want to make an announcement to the room I forgot to make. Um, we, uh, next week we have Angelina Fiordalisi coming to talk about Cherry Lane Theatre, its, its history and, and, and its future uh, and what she's doing in terms of all that. Um, and then starting October 15th, uh, we're going to be moving this entire thing ahead a, a, a half an hour. So we're going to open up at five o'clock and start our conversations at 530. Uh, so I just wanted to let you know that, that that's officially going to happen, happen starting October 15th. And that's based on the poll that I sent out.